Passover and the Feast of the Unleavened Bread were to take place in two days' time. So the chief priests and the scribes were seeking a way to arrest him by treachery and put him to death. They said, Not during the festival, for fear that there may be a riot among the people. When he was in Bethany reclining at table in the house of Simon the leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar of perfumed oil, costly genuine spikenard. She broke the alabaster jar and poured it on his head. There were some who were indignant. <coughs> Why has there been this waste of perfumed oil? It could have been sold for more than 300 days wages and the money given to the poor. They were infuriated with her. Jesus said, Let her alone. Why do you make trouble for her? She has done a good thing for me. The poor you will always have with you. And whatever you wish, you can do good for them. But you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anticipated anointing my body for burial. Amen, I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed to the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went off to the chief priest to hand him over to them. When they heard him, they were pleased and promised to pay him money. Then he looked for an opportunity to hand him over. On the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, when they sacrificed the Passover lamb, his disciples said to him, Where do you want us to go and prepare for you to eat the Passover? He sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the city and a man will meet you carrying a jar of water. Follow him. Wherever he entered, say to the master of the house, the teacher says, Where is my guest room? Where may I eat the Passover with my disciples? Then he will show you a large upper room, furnished and ready. Make the preparations for us there. The disciples then went off, entered the city, and found it just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. When it was evening, he came with the twelve, and as they reclined at table and were eating, Jesus said, Amen, I say to you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They began to be distressed and to say to him one by one, Surely it is not I. He said to them, One of the twelve, the one who dips with me into the dish, for the Son of Man indeed goes, as it is written of him, but woe to the man to whom, whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It will be better for that man if he had never been born. While they were eating, he took bread, said the blessing, broke it, and gave it to them, and said, Take it. This is my body. Then he took a cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, and they all drank from it. He said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which will be shed for many. And amen, I say to you, I shall not drink again the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it anew in the kingdom of God. Then, after singing a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus said to them, All of you will have your faith shaken, for it is written, I will sh strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be dispersed. But after I have been raised up, I shall go before you to Galilee. Peter said to him, Even though all should have their faith shaken, mine will not be. Then Jesus said to him, Amen, I say to you this very night before the cock crows twice, you will deny me three times. But he vehemently replied, even though I should have to die with you, I will not deny you. And they all spoke similarly. Then they came to a place named Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. He took with him Peter, James, and John, and began to be troubled and distressed. Then he said to them, My soul is sorrowful even to death. Remain here and keep watch. 
He advanced a little and fell to the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass by him. He said, Abba, all things are possible to you. Take this cup away from me, but not what I will, but what you will. When he returned, he found them asleep. He said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not keep watch for one hour? Watch and pray that you may not undergo the test. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Withdrawing again, he prayed, saying the same thing. Then he returned once more and found them asleep, for they could not keep their eyes open and did not know what to answer him. He returned a third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? It is enough. It, it is enough. The hour has come. Behold, the Son of Man is to be handed over to sinners. Get up, let's go. See, my betrayer is at hand. Then, while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived, accompanied by a crowd with swords and clubs, who had come from the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders. His betrayer had arranged a signal with them, saying, The man I shall kiss is the one. Arrest him and lead him away securely. He came and immediately went over to him and said, Rabbi. And he kissed him. At this they laid hands on him and arrested him. One of the bystanders drew his sword, struck the high priest's servant, and cut off his ear. Jesus said to them in reply, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to seize me? Day after day I was with you teaching in the temple area, yet you did not arrest me, but that the scriptures may be fulfilled. And they all left him and fled. Now a young man followed him, wearing nothing but a linen cloth about his body. They seized him, but he left the cloth behind and ran off naked. They led Jesus away to the high priest, and all the chief priests and the elders and the scribes came together. Peter followed him at a distance into the high priest's courtyard, and was seated with the guards, warming himself at the fire. The chief priests and the entire Sanhedrin kept trying to obtain testimony against Jesus in order to put him to death, but they found none. Many gave false witness against him, but their testimony did not agree. Some took the stand and testified falsely against him, alleging, Even so, their testimony did not agree. The high priest rose before the assembly and questioned Jesus, saying, Have you no answer? What are these men testifying against you? But he was silent and answered nothing. Again, the high priest asked him and said to him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? Then Jesus answered, I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. At that, the high priest tore his garments and said, What further need have we of witnesses? You have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? They all condemned him as deserving to die. Some began to spit on him. They blindfolded him and struck him and said to him, And the guards greeted him with blows. While Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the high priest's maids came along. Seeing Peter warming himself, she looked intently at him and said, You too were the Nazarene of Jesus. But he denied it, saying, I neither know nor understand what you are talking about. So he went out into the outer court, then the cock crowed. The maid saw him and began again to say to the bystanders, This man is one of them. Once again he denied it. A little later the bystanders said to Peter once more, Surely you are one of them, for you too are a Galilean. He began to curse and to swear. I do not know this man about whom you are talking. And immediately a cock crowed a second time. 
Then Peter remembered the word that Jesus had said to him, Before the cock crows twice, you will deny me three times. He broke down and wept. As soon as morning came, the chief priests with the elders and the scribes, that is, the whole Sanhedrin, held a council. They bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. Pilate questioned him. Are you the king of the Jews? He said to him in reply, You say so. The chief priests accused him of many things. Again, Pilate questioned him. Have you no answer? See how many things they accuse you of? Jesus gave him no further answer, so that Pilate was amazed. Now, on the occasion of the feast, he used to release to them one prisoner whom they requested. A man called Barabbas was then in prison, along with the rebels who had committed murder in a rebellion. The crowd came forward and began to ask him to do for them as he was accustomed. Pilate answered, Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? For he knew that it was out of envy that the chief priests had handed him over. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have him release Barabbas for them instead. Pilate again said to them in reply, Then what do you want me to do with the man you call the king of the Jews? They shouted again. <laughs> Pilate said to them, Why? What evil has he done? They only shouted the louder. <laughs> so Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released Barabbas to them and, after he had Jesus scourged, handed him over to be crucified. The soldiers led him away inside the palace, that is the praetorium, and assembled the whole cohort. They clothed him in purple, and weaving a crown of thorns, placed it on him. They began to salute him with, kept striking his head with a reed and spitting upon him. They knelt before him in homage, and when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the purple cloak, dressed him in his own clothes, and led him out to crucify him. They pressed him to service a passerby, Simon, a Cyrenian, who was coming in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. They brought him to the place of Golgotha, which is translated place of the skull. They gave him wine drugged with myrrh, but he did not take it. Then they crucified him and divided his garments by casting lots for them to see what each should take. It was nine o'clock in the morning when they crucified him. The inscription of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. With him, they crucified two revolutionaries, one on his right, and one on his left. Those passing by reviled him, shaking their heads and saying, Ah, you destroyed the temple and rebuilt it in three days. Save yourself by coming down from the cross. Likewise, the chief priests with the scribes mocked him among themselves and said, He saved others, he cannot save himself. Let the Christ be in Israel. crucified with him also kept abusing him. At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three o'clock, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lemma sacquatani, which is translated, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of the bystanders who heard it said, Look, he is calling Elijah. One of them ran, soaked a sponge with wine, and put it on a reed, and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait, let us see if Elijah comes down, comes to take him down. Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last. The veil of the sanctuary was torn in two from top to bottom. 
When the centurion who stood facing him saw how he breathed his last, he said, Truly, this man was the Son of God. There were also women looking on from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of the younger James and of Joseph, and Salome. These women had followed him when he was in Galilee and ministered to him. There were also many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem. When it was already evening, since it was the day of preparation, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a distinguished member of the council who was himself awaiting the kingdom of God, came and courageously went to Pilate and asked him for the body of Jesus. Pilate was amazed that he was already dead. He summoned the centurion and asked him if Jesus had already died. And when he learned of it from the centurion, he gave the body to Joseph. Having bought a linen cloth, he took him down, wrapped him in the linen cloth, and laid him in a tomb that had been hewn out of the rock. Then he rolled a stone against the entrance to the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, watched where he was laid. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, come by the most powerful means of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Hear well, beloved spouse. I want to apologize. I forgot to tell you to sit during this long gospel, so anybody who's stressed or tired, I apologize for that. Today, we celebrate the Passion of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the bedrock. This is the center of our faith. When you look at the cross as a Christian, you go, oh, God, Jesus died for us. When you see Jesus on the cross, you see the person of Christ, God made man who came only to die for us. This is why he was born of man. To reconcile us with the Father, to give us life, to allow us a chance at eternal life for the redemption of the sin in Adam and Eve. That original sin wiped away through the sacraments of baptism, through confession, and we are made holy through his body and blood that he offered for us in the Mass, the Holy Eucharist. When you look at the Gospels, where do we put ourselves in there? How do we relate? To that gospel. I often put myself as a disciple or a centurion, one or the other. And in that, we look at what the disciples, what they did, how they felt, what they heard, what it must have been like. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden just like us, oh, they were like, you're going to just take a nap right here in the garden. Twice, God came back to him and said, can you stay up for an hour? They didn't know what they were walking into. So they fall, they fell asleep. And in that arrest, they scattered. The only person that followed was Peter, trying to understand what was going on. And even him, Peter, the first pope, denied him three times. Denied that he knew him. How many times in our lives do we deny God? Do we choose ourself over God, over what is right, the easy way, the six-way highway, not the narrow path of Christianity, love, peace, and joy that Christ taught, but the six-way highway. Everybody else is doing it. There's an old saying from the Smothers Brothers, if everybody was jumping off a bridge, would you do it? Not again. Right? The thing is, guys, even in the apostles' reaction to the cross, only one stood there. And I think it was the protection of Our Lady that he, he basked under the mantle of her love as she was suffering the sorrows in her heart, seeing her baby die. 
we want to have the courage to stand up? Where are we when we don't have the courage to stand up for what is right? Doesn't that remind us of ourselves? I know it does us, but to me and my sinfulness, I am reminded every time when I look at his passion. And then we see the beautiful event that he gives his soul to his father where he came from. This is not the end of the story. We know through hindsight. But this gift, who we are as people, what we believe and what we love and our chance at eternal life is Christ crucified. That's why we have life. But death is not the end of the story. Persecution is not the end of the story. Struggle, strife. The end of the story is with you. How you unite with the cross of Christ. How you go through your daily life, and if it's working or driving or fighting with your brothers and sisters or your spouses or struggling with decisions, that is the cross of Christ in you. The hard times. And what do we do? We usually cry and moan to anybody who will listen. We struggle, we get emotional about it, we get angry, and we spread that anger. And all of a sudden, a bunch of people are angry instead of just you. But if we learn that Christ is living within us through the Spirit, through the Spirit that animates us, through the life that he has given, the breath of life that is breathed, broke, breathed through the Father, given to Adam and Eve. This is indeed the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, because you're alive. And if you just take that pain, that struggle, that anger, that frustration, maybe physical pain, Maybe mental anguish, it may be worry, it may be emotion, or worry about your kids, your grandkids, it may be a struggle with your husband or your wife. That is the cross. And when you say, Lord Jesus Christ, I give this to you. My prayer that I always say when I struggle, when I'm in pain, is I praise you, Lord Jesus, and I thank you because your holy cross, you have redeemed the world. And I must say it 20 times. Because I'm in pain a lot, I'm an old football player that banged my head against a lot of animals. And my body hurts. But I give that to God. I give it to you. And guess what? The cross of Christ, Christ crucified, lives within me. He lives within you. You are the body of Christ. This is what the church calls you. So that pain, that struggle that you have, if we just meritoriously offer it to God for the salvation of souls, for unbelievers, for people that are struggling, we help in salvation. We help our neighbors, we help our friends and family. God loves us for that. And then that praise that we give to him at Thanksgiving, he pours his love and you will see miracles happen when you give up your pain to God for the salvation of souls. You will see conversions. You will see life breathed into people. Brothers and sisters of Christ, you have a choice today to live the cross of Christ. You're already living it. You're already struggling. The pain's not going to go away. But when you offer it to God, it becomes more bearable. It becomes meritorious. And in the future, when you pass, when you get to the end of your life, that very fact will become your glory in heaven. Where God will say, welcome, my good and faithful servant who bore my cross good life.